circles. So they very famously met for lunch on June 22nd, 1897. Uh, it's a legendary lunch. It started at two o'clock in the afternoon and they didn't stop meeting until breakfast the next day. They just stayed there at this hotel restaurant talking and writing and brainstorming and they came up with a plan to start their own independent theater and they called they would call it <clears throat> they would call it the moscow art theater to designate the fact that their goals were artistic not commercial that they wanted to make a place for actors playwrights directors to make modern new art theater not old-fashioned staid, melodramatic, romantic theater. They wanted something new. Uh, their goals were to improve production elements and rehearsal practices. When I say production elements, I mean design and the real stuff on stage quality of the, the props and scenery and costumes. So they wanted that to be better and rehearsal practices to be better and to be more attentive to art for the actor, and they wanted to promote good realistic plays. All right, as we look at those two goals, I gotta tell you that the first goal is maybe like 70% Stanislavski, 30% Nimrovich Danchenko. The second goal is 100% Nimrovich Danchenko. Stanislavski didn't really have a passion for dramatic literature at this point. So he wasn't pushing for the new realistic plays, he was pushing for better productions right? Their ideals were uh, quite shared, quite in common. It united them. They were, these two men were never best friends. That's a picture of them right there. It's Nimrovich Danchenko on the left and Stanislavski on the right. They were never best friends. They often bickered, but their ideals were so similar that they were um, a good team in founding this organization. They wanted ensemble acting, like they saw in the Duke of Saxe mine again. They didn't want star actors, divas, people who came in, did a star turn, stood wherever they wanted, the show revolved around them, they paused for claps in the middle of scenes, even if it broke the rhythm of the art. They didn't want any of that, which was common in the period. They wanted um, something more unified. Uh, they didn't want to deal with type and stock casting. This was coming from Stanislavski, who felt really typecast. They wanted more freedom for actors to play a lead in one show and then a character in another show to, to find their range of comedy and tragedy. They wanted to do plays that were artistically substantial, not lightweight fluff. And they wanted to feel that the theater they were making had artistic, social, and educational value. They wanted to feel like they were contributing and doing something significant in some way. Um, they wanted actors to know that the work they were doing was significant. They started their company <coughs> the next summer in 1898. So they, they meet in June, they plan, they organize things in the fall and winter. And in the summer of 1898, they, they, it starts. What they do is go off into the countryside outside of Moscow to some property owned by Stanislavski and his family with 39 actors, all pretty young, and they live there communally for the summer. While they're there, they rehearse their first show. They live on this property, they cook dinner together, they rehearse during the day, they take dinner breaks, they probably drink a lot at night, I'm sure there were some love affairs, and then they would rehearse the play. And somehow this communal living, this time's been together, the long period they allowed the play to develop really contributed to something special about them as an organization. They come back to Moscow in the fall then, and they present their first play. Their first play is not memorable in history as a great work of dramatic literature, but memorable because it's the first production by the Moscow Art Theater. They do a, a production of a play by Tolstoy, an adaptation of a play by Tolstoy, the novelist. The play is Tsar Fyodor, or like King Theodor. It's a historical drama. It is full of research. It is antiquarian. It has historical accuracy. Antiquarian, did we talk about this word before? It's in your book. Antiquarian means um, where a play or a movie has lots of historical detail in the stuff, um, 
in the details and part of what you're supposed to take uh, like pleasure in as an audience is all the detail and research. It's sort of like a celebration of detail and research. Um, that's what we mean when we say a play is antiquarian in style. So there is our Fyodor's antiquarian. It emphasized historical accuracy. This is actually a photograph from a um, later mounting of their Tsar Fyodor. Um, it was not the original mounting, but it was within 10 or 15 years. Um, and this was directed by Stanislavski. Uh, so we see sort of, you know, actual photographic evidence of what he did. But look at the detail. This is really a production about costumes, right? But people liked it. They liked it in Moscow. It was more like what the Duke of Sex and Meinigen would have done, right? This is the kind of thing he was doing. But now it's a Russian artist, uh, artistic team doing it with a Russian subject matter, a Russian play, Russian playwright. That's cool. That's new. Great. So they do that and people like it. Their next two shows that fall are Antigone and The Merchant of Venice. And here's the thing, they repeated their antiquarian style for both of those. So they did an Antigone with a lot of research about Greek costumes and Greek, Greek uh, manners and behaviors best they could. You know, they're doing it in Russian, so it doesn't have the language, but still they do a Merchant of Venice where they do a very accurate uh, scenic painting of the places depicted in Venice, correct historical research about what costuming practices would have been for Venetians, for Jewish Venetians and Christian Venetians. A lot of research, very Duke of Saxe meinigen ish work. But people started to lose interest. These two productions draw fewer and fewer audience members and raise less and less money. In other words, that first push of doing Duke of Saxe Meiningen ish work in Russia with Russian artists and Russian stories and Russian plays, well, that seemed really cool to people. And uh, it had a long development period, had a good rehearsal. So there was something good, cool happening there. But just trying to repeat that style a couple more times didn't have the life in it. And it looked like this whole thing might close. You know, pretty good try. We did some stuff. Uh, oh, well. But that's not what happened. Instead, they become super famous theater company. Why? Anton Chekhov. Vladimir Nimrovich Danchenko suggests to Konstantin Stanislavski that for their fourth play, they do this relatively new play by a minor playwright named Chekhov. He was a doctor. That they do this play that, by the way, had been produced once already and was considered kind of a flop when it had happened, a play called The Seagull. Konstantin Stanislavski said, are you crazy? Nimrovich Tanchenko said, if we're going down, can I please just do one play I really like? So they did it. And the world changed. Not an understatement. I mean, not an overstatement. More on that in a subsequent lecture about Chekhov. Thank you. I'll see you later.